<laughs> Hello, okay, right. Um, hope you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, thanks for doing the top trumps. Um, hopefully one day they'll be out in the shops. Maybe next Christmas. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. Maybe maybe in the shop in art schools everywhere. Yeah. Who knows? Um, yeah, I just wanted to talk a bit um, about a project that I, I'm not going to say it's my project, it's not my project, but it's a project I was involved in. Uh, and for me, it kind of started me along a certain road of thinking about uh, documentation, um, how you kind of share your work, um, and how do you cope with doing uh, projects with technology with people when it when when the thing that you're doing starts to look like it really matters to people and how you kind of manage that so uh, so uh, yeah I'm an artist and I'm based at Does Liverpool which is a co-working space in Liverpool with Adrian was one of the co-founders of um, uh, and there's a space there for people to share desks um, and so people rent desks or they have them for a day uh, but we also have a community workshop which is has got the usual things from digital fabrication like 3D printers, uh, laser cutters, uh, a bandsaw, vinyl cutter, a vacuum former that trips the electrics when you turn it on, <laughs> uh, lots of things like that and there's a lot of there's a sort of big community of people who use the workshop in different ways, they're either artists uh, they may be like us, they're building things. Maybe they're making kits. Maybe they just want to do something. Um, uh, and basically, I've, I've got a permanent desk there. Um, but it means I can sort of have access to equipment. And it also means that you can get what kind of happens in does, as well as it being um, a place to make things. It's kind of, you can quite easily get drawn into projects there. If you stay, if you stay in, if you stay still long enough, you might end up having to fix something or run a project. And there's a few people here who've probably had that experience. So I'm going to talk about this this experience. So um, once a long time, uh, quite a long time ago now, um, uh, this is Bailey Abbott, who's a um, she, she's probably how old is she now? Uh, she's probably just gone to high school, I guess. Yeah, like so 12 or something now, 12, 13, yeah, so maybe now. But, yeah, so yeah. she's a teenager from Liverpool and she's got some of her fingers are not as big as many fingers in the world. So she kind of had a prosthetic um, she used that she got from the NHS. Um, and her and her father, uh, Jason, uh, found on the internet an open source design for a 3D printed prosthetic hand and uh, Jason uh, dad and Bailey they somehow found does Liverpool as a place that maybe could do 3d printing so they came into the office this is the bit where Adrian might have to correct me just check it right uh, and they wanted to know how to do it and then what happens in does is that we don't do things for you because even though it's called does Liverpool which implies Things happen. <laughs> Nobody actually does anything. In does Liverpool, but you can come in and do something yourself. That's the sort of ethos. So, no, we couldn't three D print a hand, but we could show you the three D printer and help you print it. So eventually, uh, Bailey and Jason got quite good at three uh, D printing components enough so that they made this quite complex prosthetic hand. Uh, and at the same time, as well, a similar time, a little bit after that. Uh, Fact, um, who are the um, Foundation for Art and Creative Technology in Liverpool, they asked us to, with the Crafts Council to come up with an idea that somehow represented maker culture in some way uh, or sort of the new ways of people making things. Uh, so, so for a while we talked about different things. At one point there was like an open source farming machinery was talked about some guys who were building a CNC milling machine, uh, they were gonna, we were saying, oh, you could do that in public and people could watch people make a machine. Uh, and then we just kind of, they heard this, told them the story about this, about Bailey and her dad uh, making this, and we thought, all right, well, this could be a project where we basically, once again, we don't really do anything, but uh, Does Liverpool will help uh, set up an exhibition 
where uh, families who need prosthetics, whatever that need is, could come and learn how to print them, learn about 3D printing, measure up their hands and then see if they could make something like what Bailey has. So, uh, so it's a really interesting project and, and as it went on there was like more and more people involved. So uh, for a start we're like where are we going to find families who may have somebody who needs a prosthetic and it has to be this certain kind of prosthetic. It's not, it's not just anything, it's like we can't print out. We didn't have a design for a 3D printed prosthetic uh, lower limb, we only had this upper limb. Uh, so we started working with a local charity who had connections to families in Merseyside and the north uh, who used prosthetics and see if they'd be interested and they'd come and come to the exhibition and they'd get measured up and they'd make these hands. Now I think we ended up with 15 families, yeah, didn't we? Yeah. So we had 15 families who wanted to print out these hands, so each one would have to be measured. Uh, and also the exhibitions team, in fact, the charity, the people who designed the open source hand, all these people started, um, so in a way this didn't start as an open source project by default, it was almost like we had so many people generating so much email, and there was only me <laughs> and Adrian and another guy called Patrick, who's not here, uh, managing all that information, and we were like just constantly like bottlenecking all these people asking, well, what is 3D printing? Can it print this out? No, it can't. Uh, can we print it out for next week? No, it takes um, it takes 45 hours to print. Uh, all these kind of things, and then you probably all know the effect of 3D printing is that it makes people just immediately go into kind of hyperbole about what it can do. It's you know, we'll be able to 3D print the world, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, or that somebody came in and said, I've got this brilliant idea, it's a customised trainer, I'm just going to 3D print a trainer. And I was like, well, well, you know, people have been making trainers for about 100 years, and they're not using 3D printing. I think if it was the way forward, they would have done that. But then, but then, you, but then you say, oh no, but the idea of a customised footwear is a good one. Maybe you could 3D print a foot that is custom to you, and that becomes a you know, a kind of scaffold for assembling a shoe conventionally. So it was all about, we just basically had to deconstruct all these preconceptions of A, what a prosthetic was, what being disabled was. Uh, it just, and it just, for me, I started having a panic attack that, oh my God, this isn't just, hey, we're going to learn about physics through Minecraft for two hours. This is like a three month project and families are going to get invested in it. And if we mess it up, we that's it. <laughs> Game over. I'll, never, I'll have to move city. Um, so, and then also, I really did not and could not answer 30 emails a day for three months. I was going to like go insane. So, so our solution was, and this is based on live, working in a co-working space where there's lots of different kinds of people, and somehow they all have to contribute to emptying the bins, ordering 3D printing filament, uh, arguing about how's the best to tell people about an event, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, it does Liverpool have been using GitHub, which is um, it's a version control system for kind of for like developing software. So basically, you make a bit of code for those of you who don't know what it is. Uh, you share it on there, and then you're able to pick apart parts of it. You can take take it into your own computer. You can develop your own stuff, and then push it back to the central part of it. Um, so there's all that, it's kind of built for managing a complex bit of software or hardware that you're developing, but also you could use it to like just project manage a project. So I mean I'm not a programmer uh, and I spent a lot of time using this basically through this system of issues. So you can basically raise issues if there's something that needs to be done. So these are still issues unresolved from the project. Are still kind of ongoing. Um, so if you look at the 86 ones that we managed to close, um, every everything from really um, obvious things about public relations uh, to the me spelling Bailey's surname wrong <laughs> to sending 
the exhibition set up to people who don't use GitHub, all this kind of stuff. And we basically forced everyone on the, in the partners to go on GitHub and say, we don't email us because we just won't respond to it. If you want to know what needs to be done and what's happening and have a question, you have to go to this place and that's the only way we'll answer. And we just had to be quite hardcore about that. And, and, and I think, for me, I think it, it really helped us out. It meant that there was a one place that people could go to if somebody was like, we've got a member of the press who doesn't understand 3D printing. Go to this page. We've written it. And then maybe two weeks later we'd say, actually, we didn't give them enough information, so we better quickly add some more. And then the next person who goes to it, that's been updated. So, And the other thing about it is um, you can use it to, as well as managing things, it just recorded everything. So if you really wanted to find out how much went, planning went out into the project, you could go through all these issues, which you can still go through, and I don't know if there's one that's a really uh, complicated one. If you look it up, you can see all these sort of comments of people. So all our communications are all recorded, which is useful for us, but then also, and I don't think this is something GitHub is for, weirdly, you end up documenting your project in the most insane detail, uh, which is, you know, more data doesn't always mean a good thing, but it means it's available for you to filter and sort of to look at. Um, and, and I suppose really, to, to get away from the 3D printing and the cool project that it was, it mainly became, for me, this sort of, it was like a mindset or a way of working where you could share things collaboratively and you could also really have a lot of fine-grained detail about everything. So, so it, with, with our um, symposium trying to look at these sort of problems where, you know, you do this complex thing in a youth club, uh, you, you research all this stuff about technology and then you have some skills for how you manage uh, young people working creatively. Mm -hmm. I know skills we talked about falling back on in, in gym jams. Um, but it's really hard to sort of get the the fine-grained nature of that. Uh, so, I, so I thought this is a good example of how almost everything in insane detail is recorded and there's potential there for you to be able to say. Because one of the interesting things about this project was that it was to tour to Norwich, like a completely different city that didn't have a makerspace like does Liverpool. And a group of people in Norwich, they decided they wanted to set up like Norwich hack space. Um, and they used this kind of project as a sort of bit of momentum to give uh, some a project to get their teeth into that would be on a public forum and 3D printing do, does draw people in as we know. Uh, and they sort of and then but we were able to say to them, well look um, Marion, if you really want to know what you're going to have to do to do it, then please look at the issues list. <laughs> and, and we could point her to particular things, like, I don't know, just all tags mentioned urgent you could do. Oh, they're gone now. <laughs> yeah, but basically she could look at that, and she did eventually look on the GitHub and did say, oh, right, I, I see what you mean now. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to have, and she, I think she had a minor panic attack. It was a, yeah. That she was like, oh my god, yeah. And but it, so I think in a weird way, we just by trying to manage email, we ended up using this this system to to make the project. Uh, ended up documenting it really well. I think. I think what would be interesting is that you've got this level of insane detail, but how you make sense of it, and then, and in many ways that that is the kind of artist's role in a way that you're filtering this stuff. Um, so like for example in a really simple way um, on our Critical Kits website in the references um, I've made Neil do the whole conference through a version of GitHub called GitLab which is even slightly weird because GitHub is like Google, it's, they're like a massive company who host this platform for people who want to use these, this system. Uh, but you can also find like an independent way of doing it, so you could run it yourself. You'd not be controlled by a company. Uh, you've got this thing called GitLab, which you can host yourself. So, so I've made Neil use GitLab. Uh, if anybody else wants to learn how to use GitHub or GitLab, just come and.
come ask me later. Uh, so for this one, I wanted, if I thought of things like in Neil's presentation, I like the graffiti robot thing, so I made an issue about it and gave it a tag called references, so that basically, um, I've showed you this before, I think. But, um, so now anything tagged references appears on our web page. Um, and it's just that, it was just a proof of concept really that you could take all these issues. So there's the massive issue list of like the stuff that me and Neil had to do yesterday <laughs> and the week before. Not just yesterday. Not just yesterday. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So look, there's, it's only two pages deep. It's not, it's not that bad. Um, you know, you could then filter that and make it spit out something else. So it could be that if we wanted 10 people to contribute to this and use a reference tag, you know, maybe somebody gets a prize, something is triggered as soon as you get 10 references. Um, you know, we can, we can say, yay, this has been a successful symposium or something like that. So th this was my little... So the graffiti writing robot thing wasn't there yesterday. It just gets populated, updated every hour. Um, yeah, so I'm going to kind of finish up there. But yeah, I've, I've kind of just learned a lot about... Yeah, I think it was interesting that I picked a project that, in a way, it was the least project that's, that's mine. It's not, it's not really my project, but in a way it really brought together a lot of feelings I had about using technology. And it's not just about, oh, I use Arduino now, or I'm learning Python, or all these different digital skills that are out there. It's sort of to try and take, to try and think of technical culture, really. Uh, and I know we've kind of referred to that sort of, you know, that idea that there's a model for a super rational world where we can take the universe apart into modular bits. Uh, but we know the world isn't really like that. But those kind of engineering mindsets, you could apply them to sort of burrow into problems in culture. And I was sort of interested in, in doing that. And, then, and today is about sort of considering technical cultures, not just technology, and considering artistic cultures, not just actual artworks, and, and seeing how we could sort of learn from each other. So I'm going to finish up there. Um, and I think now is the next bit where we've asked all of you to bring something that you've either documented or it's a kit. Um, uh, sorry to pick on Gemma. Gemma's got a brilliant kit called Pattern Craft. Others of you might just have some documentation of some work you've done in the past. And we wanted to just, in our groups that we were doing the other activity with, we could just sort of, fre in a friendly way. <laughs> <laughs> so when I say criticism... I saw them criticising the other stuff. I was like <laughs> yeah, you can be relentless. It's almost like, I, I think it's more like a, get, a kit amnesty. Where it's like, you can say, to be honest, AHRC paid me £10,000 to make 30 of these Arduino boards but I think there's a, there's a there's a problem right at the centre of it which means they're practically useless so we can say <laughs> we're allowed to say that but, but, but it's not in a sort of but it's in the spirit of making things better and making better things uh, and really when a kit doesn't work I think that's when you really start to understand what it is you're trying to do in the first place and, and I think we need crits to not work and it's not helpful to just pretend they always work in all situations that the contextual way things don't work is really important and I think our practice is, is quite good at including those problems in it I think so I'll start waffling now so thank you uh, when are we doing this Neil are we, doing, are we um, going to go work back let's outside in the go, back room um, we'll ask Kathy if we can go in the cafe at all but I think yeah, yeah if we can do maybe a couple of groups in the back room group here and maybe a group in the cafe. It, it's really cool.